It's a blessing that you're here with us tonight as we look at Ezekiel chapter 33. So let's begin reading here in Ezekiel chapter 33 at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 through 5, and we'll get into our study. Ezekiel chapter 33, verses 1 through 5. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the children of your people and say to them, When I bring the sword upon a land, and the people of the land take a man from their territory and make him their watchman, when he sees the sword coming upon the land, if he blows the trumpet and warns the people, then whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself. But he who takes warning will save his life. Now, as we're looking at chapter 33, let me briefly remind you that you've seen things that are similar in chapters 3 as well as chapter 18. And so what we have here is repetition that is intended for emphasis. Because what God is doing is he's warning the nation of Israel that judgment is coming. And he's making it clear that they are under God's law. And therefore, if they're under God's law, they're responsible to obey what God has said. And so Ezekiel is speaking and speaking clearly to the children of Israel. Now, this is what the Lord is saying in verse 2 when he says, Son of man, speak to the children of your people. He's saying that God is about to bring the sword. God is bringing judgment. And God is bringing judgment on the city of Jerusalem. And he's doing so through the armies of Babylon. The captives there in, in uh, Babylon are going to hear. They're going to hear that Jerusalem has fallen, and they're going to begin to ask questions. They're going to ask why. Why did this take place? And so Ezekiel is to give them this message as an explanation because in this message you will actually be answering their question. Now, he's been faithfully warning the nation. The people have been consistently rejecting the message. This is a nation that, as we've been going through this book, we have seen has forsaken God. And so God is bringing judgment on them, and and God is speaking to them, and he's doing so through their watchmen. Now, it's interesting how it says in verse 2, how he says there, uh, when I bring the sword upon a land, the people of the land take a man from their territory and make them their watchmen. Their watchmen. A watchman is a person who is chosen And that person is to warn the nation, or that city, really. Watchmen would warn the city, warn the people of an impending attack. Now, obviously, in order to be a watchman, you had to be qualified. You had to have the ability to hold such a position. Sometimes people get in positions that they're not qualified for. They they want to be part of a position. They want to do something, but they really don't have the gifts or the abilities to perform that. They want to serve the Lord. They want to do something for God, but they really don't have the ability to perform that task that they have chosen to try and perform for him. I remember years ago, we had purchased some property in Ontario there on Maple Street, and we were doing some reconstruction, and as we were doing the reconstruction, we began to, to, um, to paint some of the rooms for children, for children's ministry, and one of the brothers in our fellowship had volunteered to help to paint the rooms, and and so he was in there, he had his, his buckets of, of paint, and he had brushes and rollers and the whole nine yards, and he was in this room, and one of our guys was going in from room to room and, and checking on the progress of the painting and all, and, and every time this one guy would walk in, one of our staff guys would walk into this one room with this one painter, the painter would say, how's it look? And so our staff guy said, it looks good, and he says, oh, great, thank you. And he'd come back an hour later, and guy would be working on another wall, and he'd say the same thing. He said, how's it look? And our staff guy said, it looks good. After he'd done that about three or four times, he began to wonder, is this guy a bit insecure? I mean, does he have to constantly hear how good a job he's doing? And so finally, he walked in again, and the guy said, so how's it look? And he says, it looks good. And the guy says to him, you probably are wondering why I keep asking you, How's it look? And so our staff guy says, yeah, I've been wondering. He goes, I'm colorblind. I don't have an idea of what color I'm putting on these walls. <laughs> I just want to make sure it's the right color. He'd been in there a colorblind painter, you know, all this time. How's it look? Around the same time, 
I used to stand in the back on Wednesday night Bible studies in this little hall. And uh, as I would stand in the back there during worship by the soundboard, our sound tech would always be wearing his, his earphones. And, and every time I, I stood next to him, he would take the earphones off, smile at me, and, and point at them and hand them to me. And then I'd put the earphones on and listen for a moment and smile at them and hand them back. I mean, he did that for weeks and weeks and weeks. Every time I went there, he'd put those earphones on me and I'd listen and smile at him. And it didn't, I didn't know, why do you keep handing me these earphones? He's working on the soundboard. He's, he's mixing sound for, for worship. And, and, and it finally hit me. He's deaf. He was deaf. This was a deaf sound man. So we had a blind painter, a <laughs> deaf sound man. You have to have the gifts. You have to have the ability to perform the function that you're called for. And so the watchman of Israel had the ability to do that. He, he had to be able to see. He had to be able to hear. He had to be able to sound a warning. He had to have the ability to resist falling asleep on the job. He had to be sober. He had to care about the people. He had to be willing to resist bribes. He had to be willing to sound the alarm. There were things that he, he, he needed to be able to do to be able to perform that function. So the, the watchman was chosen to do that because he was qualified. And so that watchman also needed to know what to look for. He needed to be able to look into the distance and... He needed to be able to know that when he saw a cloud of dust, that it's not just a dust storm, but that, that that cloud of dust represents horsemen. He needed to be able to distinguish. He needed to be able to hear certain sounds in, that are coming in the darkness to be able to know that those sounds are, are armor. Those sounds are, are weapons. He had to have an ability to discern. He had to have the ability to see. He had to have the capacity to be able to do that. And then he had to be, be able to, to, to sound a warning that was a genuine warning. He, he couldn't have a weird sense of humor where he'd just get bored and decide to sound a warning and cry wolf so that the entire city would go crazy. He couldn't do that kind of thing. So this is somebody that had to be trustworthy also. And so that's what the watchman would do. He would be up there to sound a warning. And so... When he sees the sword coming and he blows that trumpet and he sounds an alarm to the people, well, the people had a responsibility. Now, there are those who would hear the warning and would refuse to heed it. The, the watchman is sounding the alarm, but, but they refuse to listen. And, and, and though he was doing his assigned duty, he did the thing he was supposed to do. The people had the responsibility personally to act accordingly. And, and if they failed to respond... It's not his fault that they refuse. They're going to be held responsible for it themselves. It says in verse 4, Whoever hears the sound of the trumpet and does not take warning, if the sword comes and takes him away, his blood shall be on his own head. He has a personal responsibility. The warning was sounded, should have moved, should have, should have been aware. And, and thus, if he refuses to take heed to the warning, then he bears responsibility for it himself. But on the other hand, in verse 5, it says, uh, he heard the sound of the trumpet, but did not take warning. His blood shall be upon himself, but he who takes warning will save his life. There's the other one who listens and uh, takes that warning and acts accordingly and will be saved. And so, hearing and acting upon what you hear is what brings you to safety. In a New Testament sense, hearing the word of God and acting on what you hear results in you being saved. And so the watchman has the responsibility to cry out a warning. Judgment is coming. There are those who are there who hear the sound but refuse to act. There are others who hear the same message and act to their own salvation. The result is going to be that they are saved. And so people have personal responsibility to act. They have to get out. They have to take care of their own self at that time. Now, it says in verse 6, but if the watchman sees the sword coming and does not blow the trumpet and the people are not warned and the sword comes and, and takes any person from among them, he is taken away in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at the watchman's hand. And so basically, what is happening is the warning is sounded. In one case, and people respond. 
But in another case, the watchman doesn't sound the warning. Now, the person who is not saved remains in his iniquity and therefore is going to die in his iniquity. But the watchman had responsibility because he will be held to that for he did not sound that warning. That wicked person is responsible for his own actions. But the watchman is guilty of a sin of omission. Now, in the nation Israel's history, prophets were the watchmen. They had the responsibility of crying out. And many times in the history of Israel, their, their watchmen were guilty of dereliction of duty. They didn't do what they were supposed to do. In that nation, the watchmen, their, their priests and their prophets, often were false shepherds. And as a result, they really didn't perform the functions properly. Isaiah speaks about that in Isaiah 56. In the Old Testament book of Isaiah 56, verses 10 through 12, it reads, His watchmen are blind. They are all ignorant. They are mute dogs. They cannot bark. Sleeping, lying down, loving to slumber. Yes, they're greedy dogs, which never have enough. They are shepherds who cannot understand. They all look to their own way, every one for his own gain, from his own territory. Come, one says, I'll bring wine, and we will fill ourselves with intoxicating drink. Tomorrow will be as today, and much more abundant. In Jeremiah 10, 21, it says, The shepherds have become dull-hearted and have not sought the Lord. Therefore, they shall not prosper, and all their flocks shall be scattered. And so these are, are watchmen that are really not performing the duty. And you see quite often in the history of Israel that that's in exactly what has taken place. And so he says in verse 7, So you, son of man, I've made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, you shall hear a word from my mouth and warn them for me. Now, at the very beginning of his ministry, Ezekiel had been called to enact the role of a watchman. In chapter 3, verse 17, remember there it said, Son of man, I've made you a watchman for the house of Israel. Therefore, hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me. So this isn't a new calling. This is actually a reaffirmation of the original calling. And, and his message from the beginning was a warning that judgment was coming from the Lord. Ezekiel wasn't a false prophet. He wasn't like the false prophets who were crying out that everything would be fine, that all would be peaceful and safe. Jeremiah 6.14, speaking of false prophets, said they've healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. Well, Ezekiel wasn't like that at all. He was a true prophet, and, and therefore he would speak what God's message was, and, and God was saying judgment is coming, while the false prophets were saying, no, you're going to have peace. There's, there's no problem. Don't worry about it at all. So verse 8, when I say to the wicked, O wicked man, you shall surely die, and you do not speak to warn the wicked man from his way. That wicked man shall die in his iniquity, but his blood I will require at your hand. Now, notice how he says here in verse 8, when I say to the wicked man, O wicked man, you shall surely die. That was a warning that Ezekiel was giving. But the question has to be in terms of application uh, does God still give those kinds of warnings? And if he does, uh, how is it being done today? Now, we know that in the case of Ezekiel, he's a prophet. He has a special calling and a special message for his generation. And God is saying that to him as well as to Jeremiah and the others. They were watchmen. But does God still give a call to the wicked? And does God still give a warning? And obviously, the answer to that question is, yes, he does. Of course he does. How does he do that? Does it through the gospel, through the preaching of the message of the cross. You see, it is eternally important for us to share the gospel. It isn't something that you put on somebody else to do for you. It's something God has equipped all of us to do. We're to do the work of an evangelist. Now, yes, it's true. Not everybody is called into the office of evangelists. Not everybody is called to be somebody like a, a Billy Graham and others of, of that particular gifting. No, there, there are only uh, a few people in the body of Christ in terms of the proportion of gifts that, that are specifically called to that particular ministry in terms of doing that. But all of us have been called as believers to do the work of the evangelist. All of us have been called to, to take the message, to live it and give it to other people. All of us have been called to do that. 
And, and it, it is possible for us that we might um, find ourselves resisting what God has called us to do. See, the Bible makes it very clear that it's eternally important. This gospel has eternal things that are related to that. I've shared with you before how that many years ago, back I believe around mid-80s, how that when the AIDS epidemic began, what was called the AIDS epidemic at that time, how that I had gone to pay a visit at a member of our fellowship in the hospital who had a particular disease that at that time had yet to be really, it really hadn't been told to us that it was AIDS. And then I discovered that it was AIDS. His wife let me know that her husband was dying of AIDS. And, and they had asked if I would come in to see him at the hospital. And, and I've shared with you before how I went to the hospital and, and he was in this isolation unit and, and they had the doors closed and, and sealed and, and there he was and they told me, the nurses told me before I walked in, my assistant Randy Walls was, was with me at the time. Now he's the pastor of Calvary Upland. And Randy and I were standing there at the door and the nurse came up and said, you need to put on some gloves and you need to put on gowns and you need to put on masks. And as we were standing there looking in to this uh, room, uh, his wife was standing there without any gowns and masks and everything. And I just... I just didn't feel that I could put on the gowns and masks. I thought, no, I'm going to have to walk in there. But I have to be honest with you, we didn't know how that disease was transmitted at that time. It was really a new disease and all that was just beginning to get notoriety. I, I, I didn't know how it was uh, transmitted. And so I turned to Randy and I said to Randy, you stay out, I'm going to go in. And Randy said, no, if you go in, I'm going in with you. I'll go in. And, and I started thinking, well, you go in and I'll stay out here and pray for you, you know. <laughs> church needs a pastor, I can always get an assistant, you know, so. <laughs> so he and I walked in, and I began to minister to him, and he asked his wife by making hand motions for a, 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 a pen and some paper, and, and he wrote these words on a, on a scrap of paper that she handed to me, and, and I'll never forget what he wrote in that scribble there. It, it said, I am eternally grateful to you. And the reason he was eternally grateful is we had brought him to faith in Christ. He had come to know the Lord Jesus Christ through our ministry, and he knew he was going to die. But that word eternally still stands out in my mind because that word meant something. We use it all the time, eternally this, eternally that. But for him, eternity was right there. And he went into eternity a few days later. He died of AIDS. So this message that we have is something that we don't hold on to ourselves. In Romans chapter 10, verses 13 through 17, in the New Testament, Paul, the apostle, said, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our report? So then faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. And so you see here verses that relate to missions, to going out. How beautiful are the feet of those who, who preach the gospel. It's, it's a mission to go out and take the word. And, but how are they going to believe if they've never heard is what Paul is saying. And, and you see, is it important for us to take the word out? Is it important for us to go into Mexico like you just saw in that video that we just had before service? Is that important or should we not go? Does it really matter if those kids hear the gospel? Does it matter if, if those villages hear the message of Christ? Does it really matter? This church believes that it does. And we get that out of the Word of God. It is beautiful to take the Word of God out. It is beautiful to bring hope to people who have no hope. And yes, we do have a responsibility to do so. In Acts chapter 20, verses 26 and 27, Paul said, I testify to you this day that I'm innocent of the blood of all men. I have not shunned to declare to you the whole counsel of God. I'm free of their blood. I'm not responsible for them going to hell with, with, without hearing the message. And so there's a certain degree of responsibility even to this New Testament day 
that we have to take the message that we know and to give it to somebody else. And, and, and God is telling Ezekiel here, he's saying, listen, there's a responsibility to take this message and to give it to people. Now, in verse 9, it says, Nevertheless, if you warn the wicked to turn from his way, and he does not turn from his way, he shall die in his iniquity, but you have delivered your soul. They will bear responsibility for rejecting the message. Listen, I give invitations. Somebody comes forward and gives their heart to Christ. I rejoice. The person who hears that same message rejects it and goes into eternity without Jesus Christ bears the responsibility of making that choice themselves. They were given the opportunity when we give an invitation and encourage people to come to Christ. They're given that opportunity. But should they choose to reject it, their blood is on their own head. In Ecclesiastes, in chapter 12, verse 14, we read, God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. They bear responsibility and will stand before God the judge. Our responsibility is to declare. Their responsibility is to respond. In verse 10, Therefore you, O son of man, say to the house of Israel, Thus you say, If our transgressions and our sins lie upon us and we pine away in them, how can we then live? Say to them, As I live, says the Lord God, I have no pleasure in the death of the wicked, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. Turn, turn from your evil ways, for why should you die, O house of Israel? They're saying we have no hope for the future. If all we have to look forward to is judgment, God's answer simply is, well, repent. Repent, and you will live. Because the bottom line is, I don't want you to perish. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, we read in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9. And so God's desire is for people to turn from their evil ways in order to be saved, but they refuse. They don't want God. They want their sins. Well, verse 12, Therefore, O son of man, say to the children of your people, the righteous, righteousness of the righteous man shall not deliver him in the day of his transgression. As for the wickedness of the wicked, he shall not fall because of it in the day that he turns from his wickedness. Nor shall the righteous be able to live because of his righteousness in the day that he sins. When I say to the righteous that he shall surely live, but he trusts in his own righteousness and commits iniquity, none of his righteous works shall be remembered. But because of the iniquity that he has committed, he shall die. A righteous man is not one who is, that is being referred to, the righteous man is not the one who is truly righteous. He's rather the one who has that outer appearance of righteousness. And that's what the Lord is speaking about here. He's not saying that this is a genuinely righteous man. It's a man who has all appearances of being righteous and people look at him and think that he is. But in reality, the man gives in to sin because that's really what he is, a sinner. And so in the midst of a sin-filled nation, there are going to be people who are outwardly righteous. But his righteousness, God is saying, isn't remembered because he wasn't right before God. And God allows circumstances to draw out the governing principle of our lives and so under pressure, what's really inside is going to come out. But he goes on, he says, again, when I say to the wicked, you shall surely die, if he turns from his sin and does what is lawful and right, if the wicked restores the pledge, gives back what he has stolen, walks in the statutes of life without committing iniquity, he shall surely live, he shall not die. None of his sins which he has committed shall be remembered against him. He has done what is lawful and right. He shall surely live. And the one that can be known as one who is saved is simply the one who turns from his sins and keeps God's word. He has a change of heart, a change of heart that, that is consistent over the rest of his life. It's not an outward righteousness. It's an inward change of heart that creates a new life, an entirely new life. He says in verse 17, Yet the children of your people say, The, the way of the Lord is not fair, but it is their way which is not fair. 
When the righteous turns from his righteousness and commits iniquity, he shall die because of it. But when the wicked turns from his wickedness and does what is lawful and right, he shall live because of it. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is not fair, O house of Israel. I will judge every one of you according to his own ways. And this is the most common charge against God. It's just not fair. I think that phrase, it's not fair, is something that we learned pretty early in life. I've heard children say that my own have. When they were small, they can still do it now as adults. I can do it. I can say, that's just not fair. That's not right. My grandchildren will say that. It's amazing. They don't know how to speak very well, but they know how to say it's not fair. There's just something inside of us. That's one of those common charges against God. And a lot of times people will say, that's not fair that he's dealing with me. That's not fair that I'm going through a hard time. Well, the fact is that people don't like reaping the consequences of their own choices, and therefore they begin to blame God as if God is supposed to eliminate the consequences simply because he's God and he could. So God is saying, listen, though you think I'm unfair, you're actually being judged righteously because you're being judged for your own sins. You're just reaping what you've sown. So I will judge you, as he says in verse 20, according to your own ways. You're simply sowing to the wind and from... That sowing, you're going to reap the whirlwind. You're sowing to your flesh. From your flesh, you reap corruption. And that's the result of it. And so God says, as you say I'm unfair, the fact is, is I am very fair and I am just and I will deal with you according to your sins. Now in verse 21, it came to pass in the 12th year of our captivity in the 10th month, on the 5th day of the month, that one who had escaped from Jerusalem came to me and said, the city has been captured. Now the hand of the Lord had been upon me the evening before the man came who had escaped, and he had opened my mouth. So when he came to me in the morning, my mouth was opened, and I was no longer mute. So confirmation of his word that Jerusalem would fall now arrives. We, we saw that in Ezekiel chapter 24, the, verses 25 through 27. So the city has fallen. Ezekiel now hears the word that it has fallen and once again begins to, not, to denounce the sins of Israel. Remember that he has been denouncing the sins of the world up to this point. He's been speaking of judgment that's coming on various um, countries and cities and all. We've been seeing that for several chapters. Now he once again begins to denounce the sins of Israel. He's no longer mute. And so verse 23, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man... They who inhabit those ruins in the land of Israel are saying, Abraham was only one, and he inherited the land, but we are many. The land has been given to us as a possession. Therefore say to them, Thus says the Lord God, You eat meat with blood. You lift up your eyes toward your idols and shed blood. Should you then possess the land? You rely on your sword. You commit abominations. And you defile one another's wives. Should you then possess the land? Say thus to them, Thus says the Lord God, as I live, surely those who are in the ruins shall fall by the sword. And the one who is in the open field, I will give to the beast to be devoured. Those who are in the strongholds and caves shall die of pestilence. For I will make the land most desolate. Her arrogant strength shall cease. The mountains of Israel shall be so desolate that no one will pass through. Then they shall know that I am the Lord when I have made the land most desolate because of all their abominations which they have committed. So Ezekiel here in these verses is rebuking Israel for her carnal confidence. And they're saying, well, God gave the land to Abraham by, by promise before he had children. Now we're many. And by sheer numbers, that ought to guarantee that the land belongs to us because we have greater numbers. But God says, is, is that how you think? Well, you've been violating the requirements of the law. You, you are violent idolaters. You trust in the arm of the flesh. You are completely immoral. You're destroying the sanctity of marriage. But you think that the land is yours. Not only that, notice verse 27, you put your confidence in the sword. And by the sword, 
you will perish. So God is saying, no, I'm going to bring judgment on you. I'm going to make the place desolate. But now he says something extremely powerful. Verse 30, as for you, son of man, the children of your people are talking about you beside the walls and in the doors of the houses. And they speak to one another, everyone saying to his brother, please, come and hear what the word is that comes from the Lord. So they come to you as people do. They sit before you as my people, and they hear your words, but they do not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear your words, but they do not do them. And when this comes to pass, surely it will come. Then they will know that a prophet has been among them. These verses here have been very personal verses to me for many, many years. Many years. And what, what the Lord is speaking about here, I think has practical application in our day. You see, he's speaking to people who are there, the captives who are in exile in Babylon. And, and God is saying that these people's apparent interest in his ministry, in no way, in no way reveals that they have sincere faith at all. It's not proof of their sincerity. These people enjoy hearing what he has to say. They enjoyed his power. They enjoyed his eloquence. They enjoyed so much about what Ezekiel was all about. This is a man that they could respect. This is a man that spoke with such authority. And, and they did appreciate it. They did like the way he spoke. And they would even listen to his message. But they refused to obey it. And that's what the Lord is speaking about. Notice how he says in verse 30, as for you, son of man, the children of your people are talking about you beside the walls and there in the doorways of the houses. So what he's saying is you are, you are the one that people speak about the most as they're walking around. They'll lean against the wall and in, when it's warm and they're getting shaded there and they lean against the wall in the shade and, and, and you are the topic of conversation. They speak concerning you and the things that you've been saying or... They'll be there in the doorways and, and a neighbor may be passing by and they motion to the neighbor and the neighbor comes up there and joins them there in their doorway where they're living and, and, and they begin to speak, they begin to talk. They're in small groups and, and as they're in these small groups throughout the city, they bring up Ezekiel in their conversation. What's interesting to me is they have an outward appearance of being people who are actually sincere. Not only do they have that outward appearance of being sincere, but notice in verse 30 how it says uh, that they speak to one another, saying to his brother, everyone saying to his brother, please come in here, uh, what the word is that comes from the Lord. They, they even have a, a bit of an evangelism thing going. They, they like what you're saying so much uh, that they actually invite others to come and hear you speak. The things that you are saying really, really genuinely entertains them. These are people who are inviters. And these are the kinds of people who were hearing him and, and, and they said, man, this guy's got something to say. He's got something to say that's really important. And, and they weren't ashamed to go and speak to one of their friends and say, man, you've got to come and you've got to hear this guy. This guy's got something to say. You need to listen to it. They were inviters. You know, everybody knows that churches grow through invitations. I mean, you can go out and you can take out all the ads that you want you can, you can do all kinds of things to publicize your presence. But the way churches here in the 21st century grow and have always grown is, is by word of mouth. It's by people inviting others and saying, I've got a place that I go that I think you'd, you'd profit from. I think that you'd appreciate it. And, and that's how churches grow. That's the, the way that most churches grow. And, and so you see these are the people who go out and, and they invite other people to come in here. And, and not only do they invite, notice verse 31, they come to you as people do and they sit before you as my people and hear your words. They come and they listen. And they talk about you. 
These are the people who, who will come in and notice how he says, they sit before you as my people. They, they crowd around you. They listen attentively, reverently. They appear to be godly. They're not the kinds of people who stand up and walk out when Ezekiel's speaking. They stay there and they listen to the whole thing. And they seem eager to hear everything that you have to say. They want to know these things. They have all of those appearances. And by outside appearances, in, in church speak, they're the uh, dream congregation. They talk positively about the pastor after they leave the service. They, they invite people to come to church. They reveal their delight in what they're hearing. They sit quietly. They sit attentively. They sit patiently. They sit reverently. They seem to be soaking in everything that is being said. They are the dream church. When the pastor comes out and he's respected by the people who are there, when he opens his mouth, they become quiet. They're attentive. They sit before you, he said, as my people. They have that appearance that they're really sincere. He said, but there's a bit of a problem here. He said, they sit before you as my people and they hear your words, but they do not do them. For with their mouth, they show much love, but their hearts pursue their own gain. Indeed, you are to them as a very lovely song of one who has a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument, for they hear your words, but they do not do them. And it's a bit of a problem. They don't practice what's being preached. Now in Matthew, if you take notes, chapter 7, verses 24 through 27, Jesus said it like this, Whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew and beat on that house, and it did not fall. For it was founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain descended, the floods came, the winds blew, beat on that house, and it fell. Great was its fall. The difference. It's interesting to notice the difference is those who hear and do and those who hear and do not. When Jesus is speaking there, he says the conditions that exist, exist for both the righteous and the unrighteous. Both the person who hears his word and does it, as well as the one who hears it and does not do it, encounter storms in life. Yet the one who hears the word of God and does what God says is able to remain strong because his life is founded on something more solid than sinking sand. Storms hit everybody's life. People go through troubles. Believers and unbelievers alike go through storms and go through pain and go through sorrow, go through times of trial and go through loss and everything else. I used to wish, I still do, frankly, that, that I could give an invitation with the promise, if you come to Jesus Christ tonight, you will never have a problem again. Man, that would be a lie. Because you, when you begin to follow the Lord, you know this. That's when it seems your problems start. I got saved, and I was so excited. Oh, I was so blessed. Life was great for three days. <laughs> and then I started going through my crises and my trials of faith, and it's been that way for almost 39 years. One thing after another. One storm after another. One trial after another. One pain after another. And sometimes it can feel like wave upon wave upon wave and it just doesn't seem to let up. One thing after another. Those of you who body surf or surf, you know you go out into that surf and, and sometimes these sets come rolling in. You get underneath one wave and here comes the next. You get underneath that one, here comes the next. And sometimes it pounds you and pounds you and pounds you and you just, man, you're losing breath. You're getting to be nervous because it doesn't seem like it's ever going to stop and then it calms for a while. You catch your breath and here comes another set. That's the way it works. 
And so you say, then why should I get saved? Well, because if you drown, you go to heaven. <laughs> the fact is, everybody goes through trials. Everybody goes through tough times. But the one who builds their life on the solid rock of Jesus Christ in his word has a hope that is real. It's not the hope that's a result of some promise some person gave to us. That hope comes because we have a God who cannot lie, who tells us the truth and holds fast to us through all things. You see, these people with their mouth were showing much love, but their hearts pursued their own gain. In other words, they were skillful in saying the right kinds of things, but their hearts were not truly regenerated. They were skillful in, in saying, oh, I just love God with all of my heart. I just love the Lord with everything that's in me. It's like those who party on Saturday and serve on Sunday. There's a lot of people who do that. There are a lot of people who go out and they live in the world six days out of the week and the seventh day they come in and serve in their churches. With their mouth, oh, they profess great love. But their hearts are far from God. And that's sad. I mean, that's the situation. That's the condition of the church today. I was talking to a friend of mine recently who was asked me my opinion on something. He said a particular fellowship. He went to a church. He was asking me, what is your opinion on this? So when you ask me and you're asking for an honest response, I'll give you one. And he says, worship is very entertaining. He says, this particular church has a light show. He says, the lights are just going over. He says, it's like you're at a concert in any kind of, you know, arena or whatever. He says, the lights are all over the audience. He says, and then the people up there leading worship are dancing, you know, bouncing up and down and all. And he says, what do you think about that? And I said, what do I think about that? I, I said, well, you call it worship, but in reality what you're talking about is music, right? He says, no, I'm talking about worship. I said, no, you're talking about music. I said, because what you're asking is, is what do I think about the entertainment value of having lights and people bouncing around on a stage? And in reality, I said, what I think that is, is I think that's entertainment. I said, is it worship is a different question. Because I said I would submit that it's not worship. I would submit that that's a music concert. Now, do I like good music? Absolutely. Do I think that that worship leader who's trying to get me bounce with him, to bounce with him, do I think that I'm going to be worshiping the Lord by jumping up and down? I said, I'd rather doubt that. Because I'm distracted away from Jesus Christ because I'm too busy losing wind because I can't bounce that long. <laughs> I'm going to get tired. My aerobic's not up to snuff. What do I think? I think that churches are filled with entertainment. I believe that there are some very large works throughout this nation that are filled with entertaining speakers who don't teach the, the truth of the word. Absolutely, there's no doubt about that. And I, I believe that churches sometimes that are pastored by genuine faith-filled men of God are filled with people who don't have a desire to serve Jesus Christ. There's no doubt about that at all. That's absolutely true. It's the biggest church in town, therefore I go to that church. Why? Because I'm running for political office and I want to have people know that I go to church and therefore I go to the most impressive church. I've had people approach me here who are candidates for political office, shake my hand, tell me that they're, they're here today as if I'm going to stand up here and say, oh, by the way, so-and-so is out there. Let's all rise and give this person a uh, standing ovation because he's running. Are you kidding me? But there are people who do that. There are people who do that. Like, you're supposed to just be impressed. And they will come to church here and other churches like this, and they'll say, um, oh, I am part of that. No, they, they hear, but they do not do. They're not there to actually have their lives changed. They're there for a variety of other reasons. People come to churches and sit like they're genuine Christians, when in reality what they're trying to do is pick up on the girl that invited them to church. And they will put on like, oh, yeah, I love Jesus, hallelujah, praise God, amen, and all of that until they seduce her. And then they go to another church and seduce somebody else. We've chased wolves out of here before where we found out this guy's scamming on that girl. We've chased him out. We're shepherds. I'll, I'll say pick up that stick and chase him out of here. They shouldn't be in here. They're going to rip off that sheep. 
The girls get all hurt and all upset. Oh, you know, no, you're judging. No, what we're doing is protecting you because this guy's a wolf. He's going to rip you off. He's going to hurt you. Oh, well, who told you to? The word of the Lord says I'm to protect the sheep. Now, if you want to go out there and get ripped off, that's your choice. I sounded the trumpet. You don't want to hear it. It's up to you. But the fact is, that person's going to hurt you. And we are here to protect you from that. That's what shepherds do. But there are people who come to churches and they'll sit there as God's people and, and they say, oh, you've got to hear what's being said. And that's what Ezekiel's saying. Ezekiel, it's like they're going to a concert. You've got a great voice and you're very skillful on your musical instrument. And they come and they enjoy you. They are so entertained by you. They appreciate your skill, but they ignore your message. It reminds me of Mark chapter 6, verse 20, where there it speaks of Herod. Herod had taken his brother Philip's wife. John the Baptist had spoken and had said, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. Herodias, the wife of Herod, got upset, and Herod ultimately put him in jail. And, and yet it tells us in, in Mark chapter 6, verse 20, that Herod feared John, knowing that he was a just and holy man. And he protected him. And when he heard him, he did many things and heard him gladly. Herod listened to John the Baptist, protecting him and hearing him gladly, until through a drunken oath, and we all know the story, on his birthday when he had his captains and, and chief politicos with him. And he made that drunken oath to Herodias' daughter, ask for me up to half of my kingdom and I'll give it to you. What do you want? And that's when she scurries off to her mom and says, I can have anything in this kingdom up to half of it. What should I ask for? Ask for the head of John the Baptist. Her immediate response. And he said, I don't want to do this, but for his drunken oath's sake... And because he wanted to save face in front of his men, John's head was delivered to Herodias on that platter. He listened to him, even heard him gladly, and did some of the things. But when it came down to it, he never accepted what the message was. There are some people today who do the same thing. God is saying, they hear your words, but they don't do them. You know, sin can be divided into the sins of commission, which means we do what we've been commanded not to do, sins of commission. God says, don't have idols. We have idols. God says, don't take my name in vain. We take his name in vain. God says, do not murder. We murder. We commit adultery. We, we, we can steal and lie. We can covet. We can do all of those things. And those things are, are called sins of commission, but there are also sins of omission. A sin of omission is not doing what we know we are supposed to do. James 4, 17 says, to him who knows to do good and does not do it, to him it is sin. James 1, says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Jesus in John 13, 17 said, if you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. See, so the question is, and I ask myself this, by the way, I, sometimes the passion that comes out you may think is being directed to you. It's not, it's directed to me. I ask myself this question. What is it that I know I'm supposed to be doing that I refuse to do? What is it that I know I'm supposed to do that I refuse to do? That I refuse to do? What is it that you know you're supposed to be doing and you've refused to do? Because we come and we, we hear our Bible studies, we read the Word together, we have our devotions daily, we read the Word of God, and God speaks to us. What is it that He wants us to do that we refuse to do? We know more than we do. Now, I don't say that to, con to condemn anybody. I don't say that to my own condemnation. That's just a fact. I think that the real thing is, is I know that. And what I try to do with the Lord every day is, is I ask him, God, help me to do what you've called me to do. Help me to be obedient today. I do it one day at a time. Help me to be obedient today. It's, it's interesting how 
layer upon layer, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, these days and weeks and months and years begin to add up and a life is slowly but surely changed over the course of those days, months, and years. And the willingness to obey becomes more and more your simple lifestyle. At first, it isn't easy, I have to be honest with you. There are so many things that I would rather do than some of the things I'm supposed to do. But over time, I've learned to die to certain things because I see the life and joy of doing the right things. That's how it works. And over time, you grow. These people came, sat there, and said, man, you got to hear what this guy's got to say. This is the most skilled, eloquent, powerful preacher. He says they act just like they're really genuine, but in reality, they're not. They hear, but they don't do. And he says, finally, when this comes to pass, surely it will come. They will know that a prophet has been among them. Time is going to prove your words to be true. And by experience, they'll know that you spoke for me. They're going to know that they weren't listening to some hireling singing. They're going to know that Ezekiel is a man of God. They will know that a prophet has been among them. God help us. God help us all. Starting with me, God help us all to put into practice what God has said in his word because in that is a blessing. You see, Paul said, the things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do. And the God of peace will be with you. Do these things. There's a result. The God of peace will be with you. I, I simply want to have fellowship with the God of peace, and I want to have his peace in my life.